Late one autumn night, reclusive architect Simon Dale is bludgeoned to death in his country house. Accused of his murder is his ex-wife, the Baroness de Stemple, Susan Wilberforce. She was always threatening him that she was going to get someone to kill him. The alleged motive involves Heath House, which Susan co-owns, but Simon still lives in. Yes, I did want him out of house, it's quite true. But I didn't need to have to kill him for it. The case illuminates dark secrets and a web of deceit. Can Susan's testimony clear her name? In the case of the murder in the mansion. Sixty-eight-year-old Simon Dale lives alone in the country mansion, Heath House. The eccentric old man is convinced the house is connected to the legend of King Arthur. Simon is nearly blind, but manages to get by without help and keeps to himself. Then, on September the 11th, 1987, he is murdered. This man in the 60s, living in rather odd circumstances, but doing no and any harm, opened his door on a Friday night in the middle of Shropshire and was subjected to the most brutal, violent attack, whose design really can only have been to kill him or do him very, very serious injury. Two days later, Simon's secretary phones Heath House. When he doesn't answer, she drives over to check on him and finds Simon's lifeless body on the kitchen floor. One of the first officers to arrive on the scene is forensic expert Geoffrey Daniels. It was in the East Wing kitchen porch that there was the first uh, indication of uh, violent activity. Inside the kitchen, the deceased was lying on his back, and there was uh, blood around the head. Close examination revealed what appeared to be five uh, wounds uh, to the top of the head. And also there was a slight mark to the throat. Simon Dale's head wounds had been made by a heavy, blunt instrument. But the police also noticed that the kitchen table has been moved. The deceased had struck his throat whilst falling forward on the edge of the table, resulted in a, a broken thyroid and hyoid bone, and so he would have uh, choked on his own blood. Simon Dale's death horrifies the local community. We heard that he'd fought bitterly this person who killed him, and I thought, fancy fighting a blind man to kill him. You must be pretty horrible. At first, police are puzzled by the crime. There was no ordinary, inverted commas, criminal motive. There was no theft. There was no burglary from within the house. But it doesn't take long for the investigation to point directly at Simon's ex-wife. Susan Wilberforce has remarried and has gained the title of Baroness de Stemple. There was only one motive. It was someone who hated him with such venom they would go to that length. And the Baroness de Stemple was the only person of which there was evidence uh, 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 of someone really hating him at all.
The acrimony between Susan Wilberforce and Simon Dale revolved around Heath House, the Queen Anne mansion they had bought a couple of years after they married, with Susan's money. Susan is impeccably aristocratic. She is descended from Sir William Wilberforce, famous in Britain as the man who abolished slavery. But despite Susan's breeding, she has no real money. All of Susan's assets are tied up in Heath House, and twelve years after she divorced Simon, he still refused to move out. The battlefield was Heath House. She appeared to become obsessed with getting it off him, getting it onto the market, and getting her half share of the value. With Simon dead, the house is now solely owned by Susan. But did she kill him to get it? In the months leading up to Simon's murder, Susan is often on the grounds of Heath House. She is renovating the exterior because she wants to sell it. But Simon won't let her over the threshold and has even put locks on the windows. One day when I went, she'd been there with some of her children on the higher windows with ladders and things, trying to get these locks undone. He, he was quite worried. Simon is convinced Susan has managed to break in. She and her children got in and took furniture, according to Simon. It really was, to all intents and purposes, it had been pretty well cleared. Susan claims three quarters of the furniture was hers anyway. But it's alleged that some of Susan's other behavior is more threatening. We find Simon sometimes almost frightened because he was blind living alone. He'd say, she's been here and she's going to have me killed and things. And we'd say, oh, nonsense, you can't do that in these days. Well, he said once to us, she says she can drop on two people in Lempster who would do it for a thousand. And I remember him saying that. And um, he was beginning to get a bit alarmed. Susan is reported as being hostile to Simon's friends who visit the house. It's why she is so clearly remembered by two people who called to see him the night he died. When they arrived on Friday, there was some confrontation with the Baroness. So she was clearly there when they arrived. Simon's visitors tell police that Susan Wilberforce was still on the property when they left at 8.30 p.m. Within 12 hours of the discovery of Simon Dale's body, police are at Susan Wilberforce's door. The discovery of the body on the Sunday afternoon led to the police attending late at night on the Sunday, after midnight, to go and, into, well, to go and tell her and get some account from her. She was up, she was clothed, they banged on the door, she didn't answer immediately, and they told her relatively quickly that they'd come to announce that Simon had been found dead. And she never asked how, when, where, or why. Uh, nil response, no questions. And she said to the police, has he burned the house down? When he was attacked the previous Friday night, Simon had been cooking his dinner. By the time his body was found, the kitchen is boiling hot because the oven and hob have been on constantly for two days. Susan Wilberforce's behavior makes police instantly suspicious of her. And during their search for the murder weapon, they uncover another link to the Baroness de Stemple. On the back of a door in the cottage within the grounds of Heath House, a jemmy, which is also referred to as a case opener, was found. And there was some reference by a witness or witnesses that she would often carry this jemmy uh, for the purposes of gardening. The jemmy is a possible match to the wounds on Simon Dale's head. 
it's sent off to the forensics lab for testing. After we'd um, done as much as we could, the uh, cleaner was allowed to examine the premises and she thought that one of the pokers may have been missing from the main hall. The missing fire poker is another contender for the murder weapon. After an extensive search, police are amazed when it turns up in the back of Susan Wilberforce's car. Susan claims she borrowed the poker to clean her chimney. The mounting evidence against her does nothing to soften Susan's attitude. Her conduct in interview by the police was strange in the extreme. She viewed them with disdain as people who were intruding into her affairs and her life and to whom she was hostile. Police search Susan's house. To their frustration, they don't find anything that connects her to Simon Dale's murder. But they do find something highly suspicious. One of the things they came across when her house was searched was a, a, a will made by uh, Lady Illingworth. Lady Illingworth was Susan Wilberforce's great aunt, known lovingly as Puss. She had helped raise Susan, introduced her to London High Society, and was fabulously wealthy. Great Aunt Puss had moved out of her large London flat in 1984 and into Susan's small cottage. The uh, officer who was in charge of the uh, murder investigation made further inquiries found that Lady Illingworth, who had obviously at some time in her life been a very, very wealthy woman, uh, had in fact died as a pauper in a council old people's home in Hereford. And he went to the local crematorium and he actually found that the cremation bill had not been paid. At almost exactly the same time Lady Illingworth moved in with Susan, her fortune started to disappear. The murder team working the case of Simon Dale now calls in the fraud squad. During the investigation, uh, we came across uh, numerous documents in excess of 60 uh, bearing Lady Illingworth's uh, signature. Uh, those documents were sent to the Forensic Science Laboratory and uh, all of them came back saying that they were forgeries. Susan and two of her children by Simon Dale, 25-year-old Sophia and 26-year-old Marcus, are implicated in the fraud. Also accused is Susan's second husband, the Baron de Stempel. Each of them had received thousands of pounds deposited in newly opened bank accounts. And Sophia, who has been working as a nanny, has managed to buy a second house in Spain. There were a number of sales of, uh, of jewellery furniture, of paintings. There were a number of bank accounts that had been opened and drained. Premium bonds had been cashed, saving certificates had been cashed. My estimate would be somewhere in the region of a million pounds. On December the 14th, 1987, the police charged Susan, Marcus, Sophia, and the Baron de Stempel with defrauding Great Aunt Puss. Four weeks later, they charged Susan with the murder of Simon Day. The children and the Baron are eventually released on bail, but Susan is remanded in custody for 18 months. On July the 18th, 1989, 55-year-old Susan Wilberforce the Baroness de Stempel arrives at court. She pleads not guilty to murdering Simon Dale. To make sure the jury are not prejudiced, they are not told about Susan's fraud charge. Even so, the prosecution believes they have enough evidence to convict her, although it's all circumstantial.
circumstantial evidence can be the most damning of evidence. And many murders, I, I suspect the majority of murders, are not committed in front of eyewitnesses. So many murder trials will depend upon circumstantial evidence. Everything hinges on Susan's ability to explain the damning circumstances when she takes the stand on day nine of the trial. She was cross-examined by Anthony Palmer, who was probably the best cross-examiner of his day, it, nationally, a quite outstanding barrister. And I think even he would say to you that she matched him. Anthony Palmer launches into an aggressive cross-examination. He runs through all of the circumstantial evidence which the prosecution claims points to Susan. At the top of the list, she was the only person who had an identifiable motive. Uh, and it was a powerful motive. It was a motive that was born of years of wrangling over this property to the point where it was all that really mattered to her. But Susan Wilberforce denies having a motive. Her defense submits evidence that the courts were considering an application to eject Simon Dale from Heath House lawfully. She claims she had no reason to kill him. Number two was the lack of any other sign of a crime. There was no theft, there was no burglary from within the house. He had money in his wallet in his pocket. Susan Wilberforce's defense team argues that just because nothing was stolen from the house does not prove Susan murdered Simon Dale. Number three, she was present at the house on the night he was murdered, not long before he was murdered, behaving in the odd way, hostile to his guests, spying and lurking. Susan does not dispute that she was at the house on the day Simon died. After all, she was often on the grounds and had every right to be there. She knew exactly how to deal with what she was going to have to deal with. She was a very careful, able presenter of the account she wished to give. And she was not, in my view, daunted by the enormity of the, of the situation she was in. Even Susan's alibi exasperates the prosecution. She says she was at home watching Agatha Christie's murder in the vicarage on television the night Simon was killed. In response, her own barrister remarks that they could use a little help from Miss Marple in this case too. Next, the prosecution turns to the possible murder weapons. They claim there is very strong circumstantial evidence linking the Jemmy to Susan. There was a witness, Adrian Tyndall, and he had come over one day and seen the Baroness in the grounds holding a Jemmy, and he'd asked her, why have you got that? And the answer was that she always carried it because she feared she would be attacked by Simon Dale. Prosecutor Anthony Palmer presses the point, suggesting that rather than use the jemmy for defense, Susan had attacked Simon with it. Susan is reported as saying, you can suggest that until you're blue in the face. That is not true. The other possible murder weapon is the fire poker, retrieved from the back of Susan's car. It was examined by forensics, but it had been scrubbed clean. To the prosecution's frustration, there is no forensic link to Susan. There was no evidence found on either the poker or the case opener uh, to indicate that it was well and truly involved in causing the wounds to Simon Dale's head. Only once does prosecutor Anthony Palmer appear to rattle Susan Wilberforce when he suggests she was getting increasingly frustrated by her ex-husband. She was in a bit of trouble on one point, 
and snapped out an obscenity. The word she used was bollocks. I think she said bollocks Mr. Palmer, but she certainly said the first word. <laughs> But rather than fuel the impression that Mr. Palmer has her on the ropes, Susan's outburst breaks the tension. The public gallery almost cheered. I have to say that I don't think she was ever rattled. She was as calm and controlled from beginning to end at all stages. On August the 1st, 1989, the jury retires to deliberate. It takes just under four hours to return a verdict that declares Susan Wilberforce not guilty of murdering Simon Dale. Two years later, in a typical act of defiance, Susan gives an interview in which she dismisses the entire basis of the case against her. Well, they had to think up something, didn't they? Um, yes, I did want him out of the house, it's quite true. But I didn't need to have to kill him for it, because the court was going to do it, and we were waiting for a date for it to be officially done. I didn't think I had a motive at all. Still, back in 1990, despite having just won her murder trial, she did not succeed in winning her freedom. Well, after the Baroness had been acquitted of the murder, uh, she was taken back to the remand centre from when she'd come to uh, wait to stand trial for the fraud. Throughout the murder and fraud investigations, Susan has maintained her innocence. But three weeks before her fraud trial begins, she changes her plea to guilty. I think she must have been uh, advised by her legal advisers that the, uh, that the evidence was completely overwhelming. In the same interview two years later, Susan is asked if she pleaded guilty because she knew the evidence was stacked against her. I don't think so at all. I think it's a lot of nonsense. Because you quite obviously forged her signature on a will, as well as many other documents. Well, that is a result of plea bargaining um, when I was under very great pressure, and I just, in a weak moment, gave in and agreed to plead guilty, but it doesn't mean to say I've done it. Just because you plead guilty, you know, it doesn't mean to say you've done it. On the 19th of February, 1990, Susan Wilberforce's children, Marcus and Sophia, arrive at court. Unlike their mother, they are pleading not guilty. They maintain they were unwitting accomplices in defrauding their elderly relative, Lady Illingworth. Susan's second husband, the Baron, also protests his innocence. He claims he was merely a porter for Lady Illingworth's belongings. After a three-week trial, the jury finds them all guilty. Marcus was sentenced first, and yes, he did collapse on the floor and uh, had to be picked up and helped out of the court. Marcus falls to the ground less than two metres from his mother. Susan didn't respond to it at all. Uh, uh, if she did flick her eyes down, uh, I, I was actually in court at the time and watched her. She didn't move her head uh, towards where Marcus had fallen. She just looked straight ahead of him. Nor does Susan Wilberforce react when the remaining sentences are handed down. The Baroness got seven years. Uh, the Baron got four years. Sophia, 30 months. And Marcus, 18 months. Susan Wilberforce never moved back into Heath House. The home she bought with Simon Dale when they were first married, sold in 1993, for just over a quarter of a million pounds. But Susan didn't receive any of the money. It was swallowed by a long-running legal battle instigated by Lady Illingworth's estate to try to reclaim the old lady's fortune which Susan stole. No one has ever been convicted of the murder of Simon Dale. The case remains open today. <laughs>